This is the sixth video for the ethics and legal considerations part of the animal chiropractic class. In the last three videos, we've talked about licensing. I just want to provide a quick reminder. Veterinarians have a general practice to work on animals. So veterinarians will be allowed to provide animal chiropractic without any additional supervision. But chiropractors and other laypersons do not have a license to treat animals, even though they may have been certified in animal chiropractic. So with the exception of Oklahoma, uh, chiropractors and other laypersons can provide animal chiropractic care only under the supervision of a veterinarian and only in compliance with those state's rules. Uh, be certain that you comply with those rules uh, and avoid conflicts with the boards of examiners for the veterinary medicine and the boards of examiners for chiropractic. In this video, we're going to talk about informed consent. In my personal opinion, informed consent is a very important part of the relationship between the doctor and the client. I think if it's handled well and properly, it increases the client's confidence in the doctor. It builds a relationship between the doctor and the client, and it will make the client more likely to refer others to the doctor as well as to return to the doctor in the future. But I also think that informed consent is usually handled very poorly. One mistake a lot of doctors make is to overwhelm the client with information. Talk about too many different options, too many different benefits and risk and harms and alternatives. And the end result is the client is so confused that they turn to the doctor and say, okay, what do you think is best? In that situation, the patient, or rather the client, is not making a decision at all. They're merely deferring to the doctor to make the decision for them. And I think part of informed consent is, is a key part of informed consent, is getting the client to make decisions when it's necessary to make decisions about the animal's care. The other concern is summarized by this quote from George Bernard Shaw. The single biggest problem with communication is the illusion it has taken place. I think in many doctor's offices, both for humans and for animals, the doctors kind of take the position that if they've presented a form to the client that, the, that is titled informed consent and the client has signed that form, that that means you've met the requirements for informed consent. Now look, I'm an attorney. I'm not going to tell you you shouldn't get informed consent in writing. But I really think informed consent needs to be a lot more than just putting some unintelligible form in front of a client and expecting them to sign it. Informed consent is really an educational process. This is the doctor's opportunity to explain animal chiropractic to the client. What is animal chiropractic? Why is it safer than the alternatives? Why is it more effective for this animal than the alternatives? And does it make sense? By approaching it as an educational process, it's not just about saying here are the bad things that may happen. It's about talking about the good things that may happen and what's the general nature of animal chiropractic care. I think if doctors will approach it as an educational process, they will obtain informed consent more effectively. Informed consent can improve the doctor-client rapport, that relationship. One of the best ways to protect yourself from malpractice claims is to build a good relationship with the client. As a general rule, people very rarely sue people or doctors very rarely sue people very rarely sue doctors that they like and they trust but they are inclined to sue doctors if they think the doctor is hiding things or if they think the doctor is not being fair and honest with them so one of the best ways to protect yourself from malpractice is to build that good relationship now of course if you have a good relationship with the client 
That also means the client's more likely to bring repeat business and more likely to refer others to your clinic. So that rapport is important, not just from protection, but also for the purpose of building your practice. So having looked at the benefits of getting informed consent, why is it that so many doctors do such a poor job of getting informed consent? I think one reason is the time involved. It does take some time to sit down with a client, explain what's going on, and provide answers to questions, to engage in a dialogue with the client to make sure that they are making a good decision about the care for their animal. So think carefully about how that works. I think if a doctor will spend time during one of the first few visits, usually the first visit is the best visit to spend this time, and will spend a little more time with the client to discuss questions and to discuss the situation, it will make it possible for the doctor to spend much less time with the client in the future because the client already understands what's going on and what the doctor is doing and they've had their questions answered. So it's a, it's a, a deferred benefit. Providing the time or spending the time up front provides the deferred benefit of being able to spend less time in the future, as well as the benefits of this increased uh, relationship. So it's a good idea, especially with new clients and new animals coming into the office, to block out enough time so that the doctor has time to spend with that client and work on building that relationship. I think the other reason doctors are less inclined or don't do a very good job of getting informed consent is, is they look at informed consent as a situation where they have to step in and, and say, here's all the things that can go wrong. Here's what happens if a mistake hap if occurs. Here's what the bad results can be. And I think they'll be more effective at getting informed consent if they remember that this is really the educational process. The purpose is to give the client enough information so that they know how to make a decision for the animal's care. And if you look at it as providing both the good and the bad part, you know, what can go right as well as what can go wrong? And what are the choices to animal chiropractic care? What are the alternatives to animal chiropractic care? Then I think the doctors will do a more effective job of getting informed consent. Now, of course, I also think some doctors, and this probably applies to MDs more than any other uh, profession, some doctors just flat don't like talking to their patients. And those doctors don't do a good job of getting informed consent because they don't like the idea of communicating, period. So why is informed consent important? <clears throat> informed consent, again, is really about the client's freedom of choice. The client gets to decide. Is the patient going to receive traditional veterinary medicine? Is the patient going to receive surgery? Is the patient going to receive pharmaceutical uh, care? Or is the patient going to receive chiropractic care? Or is the patient not going to receive any care at all? Now for a client to make that choice effectively, they need to have enough information to understand what the choices are. Uh, lay persons cannot be expected and should not be expected to have all that information at their fingertips. But the professionals, the animal chiropractors who are veterinarians and chiropractors, should be able to explain enough information to the client for them to make that decision. It's also about educating the client. Again, it's not just the bad things, it's also the good things that may happen. Informed consent needs to be provided honestly. Uh, you may not agree with the client's decision, but it is the client's power, the client's right to make that decision, and you should respect their decision. If they make a decision you disagree with, that doesn't mean you should try to debate them and wear them down until they make your decision. Uh, respect that the, they have that right, and if they've received the information in making a decision fairly, respect that decision. Of course, building doctor-client rapport, I've talked about that already. It helps protect you from liability, and it helps build uh, that practice. Uh, it also helps protect you from liability because clients 
will accept the responsibility. If a client has made a decision to follow a particular treatment path and it turns out that that treatment or course of treatment has a bad result, then the client is less likely to look at the doctor as being totally responsible for the bad result. On the other hand, if the doctor does not involve the client in the decision making and the doctor makes the decision on their own and it turns out to have a bad result, then the clients are more likely to pursue claims against the doctors. And then of course, if you have good rapport, uh, clients generally don't sue people or doctors that they like and trust. Texas has a specific requirement for client consent. It requires a signed statement. Uh, the veterinarian is primarily responsible for obtaining that consent form. I recommend that both the veterinarian and the chiropractor obtain that consent form. And when the chiropractors obtain that consent form, they should provide a copy to the veterinarian. That provides a double safeguard for the veterinarians. If for some reason the veterinarian's office fails to obtain the consent, or if the veterinarian's office loses the consent, having both forms available uh, helps protect them from any uh, negative consequences or disciplinary action for failing to follow the rules. Uh, this is a form that I put together. It is intended to comply with the Texas rule. Uh, it may or may not comply with other states' rules, but the idea is to identify or provide enough information about the client and the patient and to provide enough information about the veterinarian and the chiropractor so that everybody is on the same page. And if you go through the bullet points, it's essentially a checklist for each and every item that needs to exist for the veterinarian to provide supervision and for the chiropractor to provide that care uh, under the veterinarian's supervision or, or based on the veterinarian's referral. Consent forms in general should be signed by the client. They should be dated. They should identify both the chiropractor and the veterinarian. Uh, of course, it should include all the basic requirements for a consent form as well, like the identity of the animal and the course of treatment being recommended for the animal, as well as the risk of that course of treatment. The consent form for animal chiropractic care can be included in a contract with the client or it can be included as a separate standalone document. Uh, telephone consent should be used rarely, if ever. Uh, the only time I think telephone consent is appropriate is in emergency situations or if the doctor is working with an animal in a remote location where it would take more time to go contact the client and, and than it would be worth. So in those situations where telephone consent is used, it should be confirmed in writing immediately after the treatment is provided. And in today's world with emails, uh, it should be fairly simple uh, to provide that written consent very quickly. And if possible, the consent should be confirmed by a second witness listening to the telephone conversation. That's not always possible, but when it is, that's a good way to confirm the informed consent. So that's a very brief overview of informed consent. I am sure that you have received more education about informed consent as part of your veterinary education or part of your chiropractic education. And this is, again, is really intended just as a quick reminder of the value of informed consent and some ideas about informed consent that are specific to animal chiropractic. In the next video, we'll talk about mistakes and how you should respond when things go wrong.